Welcome everyone to Rick Hansen's Wednesday Night Group. I want to express my deep gratitude to Rick for inviting me to once again guest teach this group. I always find it uh, an interesting time to spend with you all and to be among practitioners with such varied practice and such interesting questions. My name is Stephen Doetsu Snyder. I'm a Buddhist teacher authorized in the Theravadan Buddhist tradition and also in the Zen tradition. In the Zen tradition, I'm authorized in the Soto and Rinzai lineages for those that know the Zen tradition. I've authored five books. The first is on practicing the jhanas, which are deep concent concentration states, a book on stress reduction, one called Buddha's Heart, which is the deep heart practices of Theravada Buddhism called the Brahma Viharas. Another book called Demystifying Awakening, outlining the path of awakening, comparing and contrasting the Theravadan and Zen models of awakening. And my most recent book is called Trust in Awakening. It's a retranslation of the first Zen poem, the Zing Zing Ming, with some uh, modest commentary. My next book will be out sometime late this year called Soothing the Longing Heart. And that will be looking at various practices we can do to gradually purify our mind, orient towards awakening, and open to transcendent experience. Tonight I want to talk about peacefulness and stillness. The way that I frame and present the source of all universes, all manifestations, all reality is called the absolute. It's called the absolute because it's absolute reality. It's not born, it doesn't decay, and doesn't die. So it's unconditioned. All of us and our world is predominantly conditioned. It has a beginning, it has a decay, and it has an end. So within the absolute, there are two main functions. The first is the unmanifest. The unmanifest is characterized predominantly by what I call absence, what's traditionally called emptiness in Buddhism. We could also call it nothingness. But it's not a nothingness that contains only nothing. It's a nothingness that has a dimensionality to it, a something to it. So it feels substantial even though it's nothing. It's quite impactful and profound when we, we make direct contact. Among the qualities in the unmanifest are peacefulness, deep, lasting peacefulness, and profound stillness. A stillness that's what started the world. The sign of Om in the yogic tradition is intended to represent the silence before the Big Bang, Om being the sound that was present before all of manifestation came into being. The other functioning of the Absolute is called the Manifest. The Manifest, the chief quality is presence, hereness, nowness, beingness. And part of its functions and qualities include a pure love, unconditioned, universal, all-inclusive love, and uh, pure awareness, which is awareness without concept. So it's awareness without an accompanying thought to go with it. It's an awareness that doesn't reflect on our history and find what this is like. It's the direct experience, the direct knowing. And this is the territory of realization, what we call awakening in the Buddhist tradition. Now, peacefulness is a significant quality of the unmanifest. 
The piece follows the rich, luminous blackness of absence. When we're in contact with that rich blackness, we can open to and contact the peacefulness. Conceptual peace, the idea of peace, is an absence of conflict. We're not talking about that kind of peacefulness or peace. We're talking about non-conceptual peace. It's not positioned for or against other concepts. There is a completeness and aliveness to all qualities of the absolute. The absolute is much like a hologram in that if you pick up any one piece, for example, if we pick up and work with peacefulness and stillness tonight, the whole, the totality of the absolute is available through that one function. So that's where it, it's all interdependent and interwoven in a way that we can't quite separate out the pieces, the parts, the functions, as neatly as I'm saying. They overlap, they're interactive, feeding off each other in some mysterious way. When we're touched with peacefulness, we're encouraged to shift from doing to being. A lot of our doing is set based on our early life, when we were young and we performed well for a caregiver, a parent, a teacher, or someone else. We were told we were a good boy or girl. So we appreciated hearing that and yet at the same time, there was something that's slightly dissatisfying with it because we knew that the good goodness they were encouraging, recognizing, was based on performance, not on being. They weren't really talking about me. They were talking about what I did. And so that's part of the process of shifting from doing to being because we start compulsive doing at an early age because that's where we think we get noticed, we get appreciated, and ultimately we get loved. So this is a big departure for us to move away from our social conditioning, from the performing for ourselves and others, to putting that down, to trusting, to surrendering, to deep allowing. One of the hardest aspects of spiritual practice is surrender, letting go of control, letting go of doing, letting go of any result. We have to be innocent in this process. Peacefulness invites naturally contact with silence and with stillness. Our customary mental chatter quiets when we contact peacefulness. Our compulsiveness to be seen, to be mirrored, to be appreciated, to be loved, softens and fades away to where we don't need those things. We're content, we're whole, just as we are in this moment. Within the absolute, the deepest peace, the most profound silence is found in an experience called cessation. Cessation is an experience that's foundational in Theravada Buddhism. It's required for one to be recognized as having an awakening experience in the Theravadan tradition. Cessation is deeply impactful in that it's a complete lights out experience, a dreamless sleep, where consciousness and awareness stop. We enter into this blackness and we don't quite know how we come back out. And yet we all do. So somehow it works. Some of the resistances to contacting and abiding in deep peace 
our commitment to our personality as the cornerstone of all reality. My personality is the most real. It's the foundation I can count on for all of the rest of reality to be structured or organized. Deep attachment to our identity. We see our behavior, we see our proclivities, and we say, this is who I am. This is my identity. We have ideas and labels about ourselves, which we can be very attached to. Those attachments are going to keep us from letting go completely into the depths of peacefulness and stillness. As we're born, the philosophical framework that I prefer is one called dual unity. We're born into a unity with the, the absolute. The presence and love are intimate, are undivided, are non-dual. The baby doesn't know that it's separate from anything else. All it feels is that unified oneness, that fabric of love. That's a quality of the absolute. Over time, the baby recognizes hunger and pain happen in the location of this body. No love, affection, clean diapers, food come from outside. So there's a distinction between inside and outside. It starts at the skin, the body boundary. And at some point, the child turns away from that dual unity with the absolute. The infant realizes it must choose its family, its society. I need these people to live. My very life depends upon it. Ironically, virtually all of us blame ourselves for this turn away, for this separation, for the duality that we create. Something must be wrong with me that I couldn't stay in that duality, in that oneness with the absolute. And this becomes the making of what I call the core wound. That spot in you, deep in your gut, deep in your belly, that says you're not good enough. You say, we feel we're a failure, we're worthless, we're valueless. We're bad, we're unlovable, and on and on with whatever the particular story is. But we believe that core wound, and then we construct a personality to show everybody all the great things we can do, how wonderful we are, because we want to keep them from looking and witnessing our core wound. And so this becomes an impediment to letting go into the peacefulness and stillness. If we're afraid of exposing the core wound, if I let go into the absolute, not only am I going to witness the core wound, the absolute's going to see it. They're going to remember, ah, you're the one I threw out. And in fact, we're the ones that left. But we feel that this wound will prevent us from this unity. Of course, it won't, but that's our belief. And then finally, a fear of profound aloneness will keep us from going deeply into the peacefulness and stillness of the absolute. It is to be alone in a profound way to be in the absolute. There's nothing. Thoughts will stop. All markers of me, all markers of identity will stop until there's only awareness and consciousness. There's only pure perception and consciousness, some ability to reflect upon what's happening in experience and perception. And as we go deeper towards cessation, these will thin and also cease. Stillness is 
a pristine quality of the absolute. It's the direct perception without concepts of the absence, the emptiness, the nothingness of the absolute. Within all activity, within all noise, is stillness. It's primordial, so it's here, even as I'm speaking. You can begin to listen between my words. You can perhaps even hear it in my words, because the words start in stillness and return to stillness. Within all silence is stillness. So we're making that more prime, more primal than silence itself. Silence is simply the absence of noise. Stillness can be present with noise. Stillness is quite powerful and impactful on our consciousness and our identity. Stillness settles and dissolves thought. It dissolves thought emotion, identity, the markers of me, and conceptual knowing, the ideas that we hold together that make our identity and that make our reality. All of that stillness penetrates. This is the power and the importance of stillness. Deepest stillness coupled with peacefulness, deep, profound peace, combined with the emptiness, the absence of the absolute, opens us to awakening. It opens us to the experience of cessation, of everything ceasing. All mentality and materiality cease. Consciousness and awareness as we move Awareness moves more deeply into the stillness and peacefulness. Consciousness begins to quiet too. Any self-referencing, any referencing in any direction ceases. And what's left is pure awareness, pure, contactful awareness without any concepts. So we're experiencing the beginning of cessation through this perception, through this awareness. And as we go more deeply into peacefulness and stillness, awareness itself stops and we enter into cessation or cessation enters into itself is probably a better way to say it. I'm going to take some questions now. I'll let the host select the folks who put their electric hands up for questions. And I've also asked them to periodically let me know what questions come up on chat. I don't have Rick's ability to both monitor chat and live questions or comments. So they're going to help me out with that. Anyway, so uh, feel free to ask any questions or or offer any comments. Thank you, Stephen. If you have a question you would like to ask Stephen directly, Uh, raise your hand and I will unmute you. If you would like to put a question in the chat, you can also do that uh, by, it would be helpful if you could just identify it as, as a question, put the word question first, and then what your question is. And then uh, I'll pass these on to Stephen. So does anyone have questions? at this point. Okay, I see Marilyn. I'll unmute you. Unmute yourself. Hi, Hi, Marilyn. Yes, hi, Stephen. Um, I really, really enjoy uh, when you're here in this group because you take me very deep. So when you took us uh, through this meditation right beforehand, you said, this is a meditation I developed for myself. And I I just want you to explain that a little more because I do too many guided meditations. I want to be able to take myself deep the way you get me there, which is into the 
into the the deep stillness and darkness and nothingness. And so can you talk a little more about how you develop this for yourself or how I can develop a good meditation uh, approach? Thank you. Yeah, uh, what I was referring to is the I am not practice I developed for myself about 20 or 25 years ago. The guided meditations I've only been doing for a few years, and it really started working with students I would do a sort of preamble to meditation, and then they were reporting they were feeling a transmission of the absolute during the guided portion of the meditation. So that's when I began trying out, experimenting on doing this. Just and I'm describing what's in our field. I'm not I'm not leading us anywhere. I'm not doing anything but describing what the absolute, how it's presenting in this moment. So I've got plenty of videos on my YouTube channel, which is. My name is Stephen Doetsu Snyder, so you can follow along with many of those. That's what most of my students do and find that to be quite satisfactory in doing these deep journeys that we can make into the absolute. Yeah, I love that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, Elaine, uh, I'll ask you to unmute and ask your question. Elaine? Okay. Well, I guess she does not have a question. Okay. Um, Anybody else with a question or comment? Oh, Elaine's trying to unmute, it says. Also, Tom, there's a question at three fifty at um, six fifty three in the chat. Okay. You want to go ahead and offer that? Uh, uh, sure. Hold on. Uh, the question is from Jed Stephen, and he writes: In your opinion, is consciousness or awareness an illusion, as some materialists suggest? Hmm. Well, it's a good question, whether it's an illusion. I guess what I'll say is we certainly take it to be real. So whether it's a construct or whether it's a way for the absolute to manifest as humans, I'm not sure. Anybody else with a question or comment? Okay, Elaine, uh, so she's unable to unmute. Elaine, if you could just write your question in the the chat, uh, then we'll pass it along. Tom, there's another question at 6.53, and I'll go ahead and read it. Okay, great. Would you, uh, Stephen, would you say the interstillness is the same as the quantum potentiality? I'm not aware of what the quantum potentiality is. If you could explain what that is, then I can comment. It's okay if you don't have questions or comments. I mean, you folks can always break into your small groups if that's Mm -hmm. the direction you'd prefer to go. I have uh, uh, another question, Stephen. Um, Dan Brook at uh, 657 says, uh, sociologist Lee Thomas said that we perceive as real what becomes real in its consequences. And the question would be if you have any comment on that. Well, my first question would be, who's the perceiver? If we're perceiving from the sense of self, from our investment in a personality as a fundamental reality, 
then that's going to condition what our perception is. If we're able to perceive with the, let's say, the eyes of the absolute, then we're going to be perceiving the absolute in what we see. In the Zen tradition, there's the famous saying that emptiness is form and form is emptiness. The important part of those statements is the is. It's not saying they become or they transmutate. It's saying form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So the absolute is manifesting as all conditioned reality that we can see, but it's manifesting in a particular conditioned way that's going to cease. So by working with the unconditioned, that's what leads us back to contact with the I work with the condition that leads us back to contact with the unconditioned. Here's another question, Stephen, from Ruby at uh, 657. It always takes me a while to wind down. I think because I am winding down from my workday at six and feel antsy. I keep finding I... I can drop in during the last 10 minutes of meditation. Any advice on how I can drop in faster, earlier? Yeah, the best way would be as soon as you leave work to try to leave all the work thoughts and the work planning at work. To just put down and when you get in your car to just fully be in your car driving. Attend to all, attend that with your awareness and attention. And then when you get home and join this group, be fully present here. Put down any other thoughts or distractions that are taking you out of being right here fully. And the more we orient in that way, the more present we'll be and be able to relax into the moment more deeply, whatever we're doing. Thank you. Here's another question. Well, here's the question from Elaine, who was trying to uh, raise her hand. So the question is, I have a question about the blackness that Stephen mentions. There is the blackness of one of the plagues in Passover, and the blackness in the poem in Vit Viticus, and these all seem very negative. Yet the blackness you mentioned, the fundamental reality. Can you please speak more about this blackness? Question. Yeah, it's a it's a blackness that's that's primary. So it's before everything, before there's light, before there's color, before there's sound, there's this infinite blackness that contains everything. And remember that the absolute is, is manifesting. It's the unmanifest and the manifest are working together. The power of the absence, the power of peacefulness and stillness enliven the pure love and pure presence of the absolute. And that's what creates life. So it comes from this blackness. We call it blackness, but really it's a color that's before blackness, so it comes from nothing. But blackness is the closest we can associate to it in its felt sense and appearance. Okay, and Farah has a question. Go uh, ahead, hi, Farah. Mr. Stephen. Thank you so uh, much. It was a very lovely and also very, very deep for me meditation. I appreciate that. You're always adding more to my meditation uh, kind of state of being or state of mind. I have a question. Um, whenever I go very deep inside, I see that blackness. But there are some other uh, philosophies. I'm Iranian, so mm -hmm. there is a, a Sufism or Rumi talk about the light. Mm -hmm. And also, if you see, there is a lot of prophets who just... Uh, start knowing that unknown through the light. Uh, so how is that uh, light and blackness? Is that all one or would you describe that uh, the light? 
Yeah, the light is the characteristic of the manifest. I didn't mention that. The unmanifest, the absence, is characterized by that primary blackness, and the presence by a brightness that the closest we can call it is white, but really it's a it's a quality of brightness. So it's like a sun reflected in a mirror. Mm-hmm. You know, we could call it white, but it's really something more, and that's the light that these uh, esteemed people are referring to these teachers we're coming you mean from the, the light, light that's in the manifestation the blackness is that what i heard did i hear it correctly the the light is is more the functioning of the manifest but it's the power of the black coming into the to the presence and into the brightness that is what the light is that's being perceived we can enter into the absolute through either the manifest or unmanifest so through presence and love or through ab- absence and peacefulness stillness uh, either portal is a valid portal Thank but you. we must we must open to both and have a full full experience to deeply awaken of light and blackness yes okay can it be uh, from life itself and nothingness is the same as same concept? Well, it depends what you mean by life. All the manifesta- uh, manifestation that we see in this planet Earth, including us, including mm-hmm. the sea. Well, that, we can see the absolute in that if we're deeply enough steeped in the absolute. But otherwise, we're going to see what's conditioned. And what the absolute provides for us is what's unconditioned. That's right. what it, what isn't born doesn't die. So the part of you that's unconditioned, that's what we're orienting to in this meditation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And Stephen, Dan Brooke uh, asks uh, to go further with uh, absolute. He asks, what is meant by absolute? That's a term that we use to mean absolute reality absolute truth so it's an unconditioned and always been in existence it's always been here it always will be so it's the unchanging aspect of as a source and there's many names for it but one of the names we use in the zen tradition i favor is the absolute what would be some of the other names I'm not sure what other names that would be used in other religions, Mm -hmm. but I've heard people from other faith traditions refer to it and talk about it. Even uh, those from shamanic traditions also have some terminology around this. Okay. If anyone has any questions remaining, please go ahead and raise your hand. I'm reviewing the chat. Um, And here is one uh, from a Zoom user. You have studied all traditions. Could you explain why you found Zen to to better express the Dharma in the purest way? Well, for me, the Zen tradition has both a really well-developed map of awakening, which I uh, talk about and delineate in Demystifying Awakening. Uh, So that's really helpful to have it set up that way. And particularly the Zen uh, tradition, the Rinzai Zen tradition that has the koan practice. The koans are tremendous vehicles for opening for broadening, for deepening, for expanding, for learning how to function, how to speak from awakeness. So there's a great rich tradition in it. And so to me, it encapsulates that and it's still very alive. The practices, the realizations, you know, in Dharma transmission, part of what's transmission transmitted is the realization of all the masters of the lineage. So all the realizations of the men and women 
who have been masters and teachers in the tradition is transmitted to the new teacher. So we carry the lineage quite literally in our practice. So Thomas, well, can, it, can I interrupt? Um, sure. So Stephen, it seems like a good time to ask Nicole's question, wondering if you can speak about transmission. What is it, its purpose and benefit, um, and how best to benefit? That was at 701. Mm -hmm. And if you're speaking of the Zen process of Dharma transmission, it's the it's the process where one one's teacher begins to begins the process through what we call the mind to mind seal and the mind to mind seal is a shared consciousness that particular teachers and students will have together uh, where it feels as though there's a kind of a shared whiteboard or a shared consciousness, a oneness between the two that can be activated from either position. And the Dharma transmission is, it's quite involved in the lineage that I'm in because we have the Rinzai component. One has to finish formal koan study, which is about 700 koans, do a variety of work, um, working with the precepts as koans, working with some other texts as koans, uh, to, the, to their teacher's satisfaction when they feel the Dharma has been received, been transmitted, and is activated in the student, then they move towards completion of Dharma transmission, where they're then an independent lineage, independent teacher in their own right. Okay. Thank you for that. Oli has a question at uh, 705, and he says, this sounds sort of parallel to yin and yang. Any perspectives there? Well, certainly uh, Taoism, which is the, the main place that we see the yin and yang used, had a heavy influence in China on the Chan tradition, which was the predecessor to the Zen tradition. It morphed from Chan to, to Zen. So there's absolutely a tie-in, and a lot of the masters overlapped um, that I've seen between the Taoist and the Buddhist, particularly the Chan tradition. And Buddhism has this interesting way of, as it moves into new countries, it, it absorbs, incorporates qualities of the native, of the culture it's coming into. And so it did that in, in China, in taking in a little bit of the Confucianism. We have a lot of respect for our elders and for the teachers that are prior in our lineage. So we have some Confucianism elements and then the Taoist elements as well. We have practices and uh, some orientations that are common uh, with Taoism. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, there's one more question here by David. Does the Big Bang Theory, excuse me, does the Big Bang Theory contradict the concept of the absolute? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I think that the absolute was in existence before the Big Bang, and the Big Bang was the first manifestation of the absolute, the unmanifest and the manifest sparking into life was what we call the Big Bang. Where that started or when, I don't know. And whether it's going to cease or continue, I don't know either. But the absolute is timeless. Again, it's unconditioned. So it's always in existence and always will be. And that helps. You know, we can rest in that, knowing there's something that's here always that we're a part of. Well, thank you all for having me tonight. I deeply appreciate being with you and being able to thank practice you, together. Thank you so much. All right, folks, I'll sign off now. Okay. Bye now.